beautiful fall Sunday. A few announcements before we begin worship today. First and foremost, we need to wish Dave Shower a happy birthday today. And on days like today, we also need to celebrate Helen because she's put up with him for a majority of those birthdays. Uh, and this is no easy thing, but it's something that we appreciate. So let's sing happy birthday to Dave this morning. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Dave. Happy birthday to you. And many more to you, Dave. Glad to have you with us. A few other announcements before we begin worship. Please note um, the annual meeting books, the annual reports are out in the narthex along the glass wall. Um, please take time to pick that up today before you leave. Uh, take time this week to pray over all of the wonderful things that have been happening at Resurrection Lutheran in the last year. God has been on the move in amazing ways. Particularly, I ask for you to pray over our budget that we're going to propose for the next year. Pray over those Constitution and Bylaw updates that we're bringing up to bring our uh, Constitution and Bylaws up to date and up to speed. Um, so next Sunday, there will be an informational meeting after worship. This is not a formal meeting of the congregation. It's a question and answer session. We're going to take questions on the budget. We're going to take questions on the proposed uh, additions and corrections to the Constitution and bylaws. So um, next week after worship, plan to join us for that. The formal annual meeting will be on the 30th, Reformation Sunday at the end of the month. So pick up your book and take it home and bring it back for those uh, gatherings, please. Please note that not this Monday, but next Monday, I'll be starting a book discussion on the book Being Lutheran by A. Trevor Sutton. You can order this book online, Amazon, Concordia Publishing House. The Bethany Bookstore has a couple of copies left, I believe, if you're looking for it um, yet this week. Uh, that'll start on the 24th. It's hard to believe, but All Saints Sunday worship is coming up. Uh, at the beginning of November, I'm beginning to do a little planning for that service. If you have someone that you have lost near and dear to you in the last year, since last November, um, a friend, a brother, a sister, a cousin, a relative, someone near and dear to your heart that you would like to remember and have them added to the All Saints Litany on the 6th of November, please get a hold of me. Don't tell me because I'm old. I'm getting old and I'll forget. Write it down, pass me a note, send me a text message, an email, and I'll add them to the litany of those uh, in the last year. The calendar of everything happening this week at Resurrection Lutheran is in your bulletin for you uh, to consider. Are there any other announcements before we begin worship? Then we'll begin with our gathering hymn, God Who's Almighty Word. It's printed on the back of your bulletin, and would you please rise as we sing together.
congregation may be seated as we approach God with our confession and forgiveness of sin. And we gather in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Called and gathered together by the Holy Spirit, let us come humbly before God and our brothers and sisters in the faith, confessing our sins, known and unknown, trusting in God's gracious word of forgiveness. Our merciful Father, who brings life out of death and transforms us into new creatures through his redeeming word, knows the depths of our heart. Let us make confession of our sin, but first let us spend a few moments reflecting internally and silently on the depth of that sin. Lord Jesus, risen Savior, we come to you in sorrow for our faults and confess to you our weakness and unbelief. Although in Christ our light has come, we too often prefer the darkness of sin. Forgive us, fill us with your Spirit, and free us from the shackles of our failings. Give us once again the joy of your salvation and make us instruments of peace and love in the world. Amen. Arise, shine. For your light has come, and the glorious mercy of the Lord shines around you. In the name and by the authority of your Savior, Jesus Christ, I announce the forgiveness of all of your sin. May the Holy Spirit strengthen your faith, heal your troubled spirit, and equip you to proclaim the greatness of the Lord until the day he comes again. Amen. Thanks be to God. Yeah. But you're never really alone, right? You're all, 
with someone always with you. There are times in life when we get afraid and we get lonely and we get, ever get sad. And sometimes when these things happen, we need something to make us feel better. I have a couple things in my bag today. This was a blanket that was made when Ruth was really sick a couple months ago and she had to go to a big hospital over in Rochester. There was a group of Catholic nuns who made this quilt for Ruth and it was in our room when we were when we got there after Ruth had taken her helicopter ride there and we snuggled her in this blanket and we still snuggle her in this blanket. It's become one of her favorites. This is a comforting blanket. Do you have a little blanket at home or something that you like to hold on to? You like to hold on to your puppy? Well, yes, of course. You like to hold on to your dinosaur. See, we all have these comfort items, right, that, that make us feel better. But we also have, do you have a stuffed animal? This was one of Jonah's favorites when he was little, a little stuffed animal. Do you see the stuffed animal? Can you give it a hug? See, it just always makes you feel, oh, that's so nice. And then we don't just have comfort blankets and comfort animals. We have comfort food. And mine is popcorn. Do you like popcorn? Yeah. If ever I'm feeling just a little anxious or a little worried or a little upset or a little scared or a little lonely or a little sad. Now, Carol Severson says I should not have this at bedtime. It's not good for me, but I have it anyway. <laughs> I have it anyway because it's good and it tastes yummy. Popcorn. But y'all have, what's your favorite food? It's called a comfort food. What's your favorite food? What's your favorite food? Do you have a favorite food that mommy makes you? What about you, Zoe? Do you have a favorite food? What do you like to eat? Yeah? I also like spaghetti and meatball. Well, today, in our gospel text, Jesus is going to tell us something comforting. You know what it means to be comforted? To make you feel better. Jesus says that when bad things happen, when sad things happen, when you get afraid or lonely, Jesus is always, you can always give away my children's sermon, you know that? And that's okay. You're a lot smarter than I am, and that's good. Jesus is always with us, and particularly, Jesus says to comfort us when bad things or sad things or things that make us anxious, when all these things happen, do you know what we can always do? We can always pray. Do you do your prayers at night? Before meals? Throughout the day? Anytime you need God, he's always with us. Jesus never leaves our side. All we have to do is call out in prayer. And yeah, the blanket and the stuffed animal and the popcorn, they're all good things. But nothing beats prayer, right? Nothing makes us feel better like praying and knowing that Jesus is with us. And that's very comforting. And that's a promise that God gives us. So we pray. Fold your hands. Bow your heads. And congregation, will you do an echo prayer with us? And we'll all pray together. Dear God, Dear God thank you. Thank you. That we, that we can always, can always talk, talk to you. To you. Help us. Help us. To always, to always cry out. Cry out. When we need you. When we need you. When we're sad. When we're sad. When we're angry. When we're angry. And even. And even. When we're happy. You know, we're happy. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. I got some suckers for you this time. Come on over. Come on over. So one for you, and one if you're going to share with someone, okay? Well, I like these. Well, you better take that one, then. If you like that one, you better just take that one. Okay. Well, go ahead. Ruth Heilman's going to come up and get started, because this may take a while to get this up here sorted out. Ruth's going to come up and lead us in the Word this morning. The first reading is from Genesis, chapter 32, verses 22 through 30. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob was out of joint as he wrestled with him. 
Then he said, let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The response of reading is from Psalm 121. I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, through chapter 4, verse 5. But as for you, Continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. I, cha I charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itchy ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth, and wander off onto the myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'll invite you to please rise now as you are able for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, you, O Lord. And Jesus told them a parable to the effect that they always ought to pray and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And there was a widow in that city who kept coming to him and saying, Give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord Jesus said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect, who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? This is the Gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Dear friends,
kindness, grace, mercy, and peace are yours this day from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Of all the things accidentally left on an airplane, wallets, passports, tickets, books, electronics, I wouldn't anticipate a human heart to be easily misplaced and forgotten. In December of 2018, passengers aboard a Dallas-bound Southwest Airlines flight were shocked to hear an overhead announcement from their captain that the aircraft would be returning to Seattle because a human heart had accidentally been left on board. The heart, which had been on the plane since originally leaving Sacramento, was supposed to have been unloaded in Seattle and taken to a local hospital for research purposes. But that task was never actually completed. It wasn't until the flight was somewhere over Idaho that the mistake was revealed and the life-critical shipment cargo, as it was labeled, was discovered by a flight attendant. It's funny, isn't it, how easily even vital human organs can become lost. This morning in our Gospel text, Luke sets up Jesus' parable as a lesson on lost hearts. That Jesus was speaking to his disciples about how they ought to always pray and not lose heart. Now, some Bibles use the heading, the parable of the unjust judge. Others call it the parable of the persistent widow. And I suppose it doesn't really matter which title we go with, but let's take a closer look at our parable. We meet the judge first. But to be honest, this man has no right to be called your honor. Because it doesn't appear as there is much honor to his name. In a certain city, Jesus says, there was a judge who neither feared God or respected man. Well, those qualities a good judge do not make. Let's reference the Old Testament, shall we, and pull out some of the prerequisites for becoming a judge over God's people. In Deuteronomy 1, as Moses is setting up God's design for the court system, it says that judges are to hear cases both big and small, and to make righteous decisions. In Deuteronomy 16, it is says that judges are not to pervert justice, and they are not to accept bribes. And Deuteronomy 27 says, the judge who prevents a judgment, specifically for the alien or the widow or the orphan, shall be so how is our judge in Jesus' parable doing? It sounds to me like he's spending more time on the golf course than in his chambers. It sounds to me like he's ignoring his docket and delaying verdicts. Because not long after we meet the judge, we meet the widow. Well, what do we know about widows in early centuries? Well, in today's world, widows often have a pension or a retirement account or savings to fall back on after their husbands die. But in the days of Jesus, widows were voiceless nobodies. In the ancient world, after her husband died, a woman lost her standing in the community. A widow couldn't work, couldn't earn a living, had no right or access to her husband's estate. Her only hope was to rely on the generosity of family members, and obviously this woman has no one to plead on her behalf. Apparently, she was in a legal dispute with an adversary, and we have no idea what the content of the case was, and again, it probably really doesn't matter. All the widow cries out for day and night is justice. Now, justice is not a word that we use every day in our vocabulary, so maybe the brief translation of that word would be a little more helpful. It's defense. This woman, who had no one in her corner, looks to the judge to defend her against this foe, because she has no one else to do it. But the judge is uninterested. He has many cases to get to before hers. 
she'll have to wait like everyone else. Talk about a mess. A judge who has been corrupted by power and status, and a nameless, lonely woman looking for someone to advocate on her behalf. But I guess before we get too far ahead of ourselves, we need to remember one thing. The widow may not have had a husband. She may not have had much money. She may not have had standing in the community, but this widow did have one thing. She had time. So much time did this widow have that she called the judge's office at all hours of the day. She tracked down his home phone number and called there too. She chased him down on the golf course and showed up unannounced at his favorite steakhouse and interrupted his favorite steak supper. Emails, text messages, pigeon couriers, snail mail, smoke signals, telegrams. She was relentless because she was desperate. And she was desperate because she was about to lose heart. And this, my dear friends, is a status in life no one should have to descend to. And yet you and I have been there like a misplaced hunk of muscle sitting on dry ice in the back of a Southwest Airlines flight, our hearts are easily lost. We hear scary words coming out of Europe between Russia and the Ukraine, words like nuclear war, and we lose heart. We watch political advertisements on TV and the mud being slung between candidates and parties and we lose heart. We lose heart when our plan and God's plan don't quite line up. When our timeline and his timeline are just a little off. We lose heart when our kids and our grandkids call home and they unburden all of their anxieties onto us. We lose heart when jobs are lost. When someone we love is placed on hospice care. When our relationships fall apart. Let's be honest, folks, we have a heart problem. Like the psalmist in this morning's reading from Psalm 121, we lift up our eyes and all we can see is a hill in front of us to climb. The news, the state of the world, our families, the myriad of concerns I know each one of you carry into this sanctuary on your shoulders. Our hearts cause us to despair. And like the widow, we cry out day and night, demanding that someone come to our aid, come to our defense, advocate on our behalf, because we can't do it ourselves. And we can't do it alone. Young people are dying of cancer, Lord. Nations are rising against nation, Lord. Inflation is rising, Lord. Our retirement, our nest egg is shrinking, Lord. The culture is falling further and further away from truth and common sense, Lord. As we read this text on Wednesday afternoon, as we do every Wednesday afternoon during lectionary lunch, it was our dear friend Myrna who took a look at the final sentence of the parable and said, that's a heavy question. When the Son of Man comes, when Jesus himself returns in his radiant glory, will he find faith on earth? Or will he find a bunch of lost hearts? Dear hearers of God's most holy and precious word, let me tell you, faith will not be easy to find when the Son of Man comes. And our hearts are lost. Lost in questions, in our unbelief, in our doubts and fears. But this should not leave us to despair. We don't have to wait for the Son of Man to come looking for faith. Because the Son of Man, Jesus himself, is the one who gives the faith. Praise be to God that he is not like the unjust judge we met in Jesus' parable. In fact, so opposite of the unjust judge is our God that he is not burdened by our persistent prayers, but he actually invites them. 
a little preview into this coming week's Bible study and the Catechism on the Lord's Prayer. Listen to what Luther has to say in his explanation to the introduction of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, what does this mean, Luther asks? Here's the answer. With these words, God tenderly invites us to believe that He is our true Father and that we are His true children, so that with all boldness and confidence we may ask Him as dear children ask their dear Father. The unjust judge is rigid, our God in heaven is tender. The unjust judge was annoyed, our God in heaven is eager and always ready to listen. The unjust judge was corrupt, our God is righteous and faithful. The unjust judge was arrogant and lazy, our God is always and only concerned with you. Concerned with your heart. So how are lost hearts found? When our hearts are being attacked by our own adversaries, by our own sin, by Satan, when this hunk of flesh in our chest cavities begins leading us astray, how does faith break in? If the Son of Man is the one who brings the faith we need, how do we get our hands on it? Well, unlike the unjust judge, our God doesn't delay. There is no docket stabbing with Jesus. He gives faith now, and he gives it completely to those who need defending against guilt, shame, and the barrage of ambushes from the world. He gives it here, now, in these words. Listen up. Because of Jesus Christ and because of his atoning sacrifice and death on the cross, your sins are completely forgiven. Our God comes and he gives faith in a baptismal font. Look at it. And remember the day that God claimed you here in these waters and drowned you in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Faith is given here, now, at this table, where you are handed the very mercy of God. In and through faith, your heart is not just found, dear friends, your heart is made. And now having a new heart and knowing that God is going to defend you from the attacks of your enemies and fight the grave on your behalf and advocate for sinners who deserve it not but will be given the blessed peace of heaven instead. And now with new and clean hearts, you have been sealed as the elect. You have been called the children of God on high. And for this we say, thanks be to God. Amen. You may remain seated and we'll sing together our hymn of the day, just as I am. It's number 193 in the reclaimed hymn.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. God has made us his people through our baptism into Christ, living together in this peace and in community with one another. Let us confess our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Congregation may be seated, and at this time I'll invite our choir up for their anthem.
prayers for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all whatever their need may be. Let us pray. Our gracious God, in you the lost is found. Forgive us, Lord, when we put our trust in places we should not. Bring us to repentance, Lord, when our hearts lead us down paths we ought not walk. Through the indwelling of your Holy Spirit, you have given us the faith to see your forgiveness and peace for sinners. That through the cross and open tomb of Jesus, we have been called the children of God. Use your church gathered here and across the world to call others to the table of your mercy. That their hearts might too be made new. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord of the nations, give wisdom and understanding to the leaders of all nations, especially those here in the United States. Mold those who sit in seats of power to be opposite of the unjust judge, that they would instead seek truth and rule with fairness and do what is right, even when it is often so easy to do what is wrong. We pray for President Biden, Vice President Harris, our representatives in Congress and the Minnesota State House, our governor, our mayor, and city council. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of peace, the unjust judge neglected his call to grant justice for the depraved. He overlooked his call to defend the fatherless and protect the widow. Keep your people persistent in our call to act against injustice, particularly those who defend us against enemies, those who preserve order against the threat of terror, who strive to bring about peace in all they do. Support them in their courage that they may continue to save lives, ease pain, and mend the torn fabrics of society. We pray especially for our military members, law enforcement officials, first responders, firefighters, and the like. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. God of all mercy and consolation, you neither slumber nor sleep. You are the shade at our right hand, and you watch over our going out and coming in. Look with kindness on the weak and vulnerable the grieving and suffering, especially those facing illness of mind, body, or spirit. Hear our prayers this day on behalf of Paul, on behalf of Donna, Donald, Sarah, Joe, Duncan, Polly, and with all these brothers and sisters in the faith, those we remember in the silence of our hearts before you now. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right to give it is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father. For in the night of his betrayal, our Lord Jesus, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the very same way, when the supper had ended, he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave to them, saying, Take and drink of this, all of you, for this cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you, for the forgiveness of your sin. Do this in remembrance of me.
abide at this table. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Dear friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. So I invite you to come now at the direction of your usher.
Dear friends in Christ, you have been fed by the body of Christ to go out and be the body of Christ with new hearts, with clean hearts. In forgiveness and mercy, go into your day, into your week, and do so with this benediction and blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may remain seated, and we will sing together our sending hymn, Jesus, Keep Me Near the Cross. It's number 140 in the Reclaim Memo.